I, I, I think we need to get real. I think we need to get real. The, the, there's a guy called Mark Boyle, who I'm sure some of you have heard about, who, uh, the, the, he, he's the, the, the moneyless man. He lives entirely without money. He wrote an article for Permaculture magazine which got rejected because it was too hard-hitting and a bit, oh well, various other reasons. Um, but in that, he said, uh, you know, he is working towards uh, a moneyless society and the reason for that is not because he hates money but because he says that if you get rid of money then we've got to be local. We've got to live on real resources. We can't live in this Mickey Mouse world anymore. And he said, he, the, the whole article was about different... Uh, reasons people bring up to, to, to try and prove, him, prove to him that what he's doing is wrong. And one of them is, you know, my father's on a dialysis machine. He'd be dead now if uh, it wasn't for that dialysis machine and a monetary economy is essential to that dialysis machine. Well, it's very hard to say to someone that, you know, your father's got to die, but he has. Because we can't, that kind of economy that supports that kind of high-level kit is not an option for the future. Some people are going to have to die. It's quite possible that billions of us are going to die. Let's get real. And... Yes, yes. Yes. Certainly, 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 because I don't think I have a right to say, oh, you know, I, I, I'm one of the elect. I know what I'm on. You know, that, what I said earlier on about being right, that was a joke. You know, I, I don't think I, 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 I don't think I can say because, you know, be, because I'm this permaculture person and look, I got a certificate to prove it. Therefore, I, I deserve to survive and somebody else doesn't. Crap. You know, an awful lot of us are not, unfortunately, going to be able to continue to live. And all the rest of us are not going to be able to continue to live in the style to which we are accustomed. And this is something we've got to face up to. And the idea that we can get out of it by shooting all the other people strikes me as not a very practical solution. <laughs> Overall observation on, on, on guns. I think that, you know, I really appreciate you bringing that up. I think that uh, communities and need to consider their security. Uh, the thing that really makes the difference is something that you were talking about in your, your talk, Mike, about the fact that you, if you have a coherent community uh, and you've got good reciprocal bonds between the people in, the, in, the, in those communities, that actually they cohere in a way that means that the security is very much e more easy to do. And, that, you know, I think in most cases, Strategies of evasion uh, are much more successful than confrontation. But, uh, you know, the, the question about guns is kind of site-specific. Uh, I would say in this country it's almost certainly not necessary, whereas in, in the U.S. it almost kind of certainly is. So, you know, it, it's, it, these things you, you have to re really have to be decided by a community. And I don't think anyone in the resilience conversation is talking about, like, having security for the sense of uh, going and shooting or robbing other people. But there, um, there are real real things that need to be considered and uh, one of those real things in any community is security and we, we need to take back that power from you know ideas like that the police are going to protect us and you know the government's going to look after us and actually you know have really good plans for um, how we're going to going to take care of each other I disagree. I think that actually that that's not the case, that um, resi resilience is, um, is, is scalable. It starts as the individual and it extends into the community and, and that actually the, uh, it's completely viable to have um, village-sized communities being resilient. And, uh, you know, that, that resilience on a large scale would be really good to see, but um, we're, we're almost inevitably going to see a collapsing of a lot of the large-scale structures and uh, we need to work from the grassroots up. We, we can't, you know, resilience would be great to see on a large scale, but it's not going to happen by some sure. top-down yeah. organisation. ...go out from this conference and promote resilience on a large scale, starting small with your food kit, with your water supply. That is our job, otherwise we are wasting our time. I, I, I agree with you on that. I, I think there's also important dialogues that need to be had. I was actually invited by uh, a bunch of corporate CEOs of large companies to uh, talk to them about um, earth changes. and. Uh, 
it was kind of funny. The only thing I could actually come up with with uh, that would kind of um, like be appropriate for, for for that dialogue was to say that like you, you know we should be tooling for disaster preparedness. This is something that you know it's, it's a pretty, pretty big ask for corporations to get their heads around at the moment. But when those opportunity arises, I think that we should be having those conversations and reaching out to people and um, making making people aware that like uh, you know if they have resources, uh, they could be using them for um, the human good in, in that way. I just want to bring us back to death. Um, I think it was absolutely amazing that we have got there. I think that we the fact that we broached that subject here is, is so important, and we did move on quite quickly from it. But um, I think that this is something that we need to think, we need to be prepared to think about. I mean, and actually this whole question of resilience, it is about our fear of death. It's about us coping with that, about us bringing... The, the cobwebs and just saying, come on, look, this is, we're all bloody scared of dying, do you know what I mean? And, you know, this question of, like, are you prepared to die and allow your family to die? It's, like, something we all need to think about and think about our worth in the world and, you know, let go of this grip of us being so bloody important. And, and I just think, again, it brings me back again and again to this nature connection is that pre, pre the advent of agriculture, we didn't have the same relationship with population um, control, you know, because before, before agriculture, we just saw ourselves as all other beings and we were in that complete ebb and flow of life, you know, we just literally, we, we just allowed ourselves to die when, when we died, you know, and just like all other beings. So I think that, yeah, this is what we really, really need to come to terms with, is that, you know, we're all terrified of that dying, but why? It's because we've developed such an addiction to technology and power over nature. So, yeah, I just, for me, let, let's talk about death, you know, and let's really take that ego place of thinking, why do I think I'm more important? Why do I think that I deserve to fly? Why do I think I deserve to have all these little things that are, when each and every one of us leave this door, are going to go and do a whole array of things that we know are not serving this purpose that we're all here sat talking about? I'm just as guilty as every one of you. So, yeah, I just think it's the more we can face that, the better. So uh, we're coming to the uh, to the end now, and um, it's a really passionate debate. It's got more uh, more passionate to go on. I can see lots of hands going up, but uh, we've already rolled right over the next uh, discussion, and uh, we have Mark um, uh, Mac uh, rather uh, five o'clock. I'm looking for them to say yes, yes. So um, I know when we had between the last two talk and this one, there was, everyone wanted to rush off to get lunch and stuff, but we want to make sure people have a break because uh, Mac will, will be a really good uh, speaker and well worth going back for. So um, let's have uh, some just closing thoughts to kind of uh, summarise what your thoughts about resilience. We started with a definition and we've had uh, uh, lots of things about education and the guns and communities and governments and so on. Where, uh, where, uh, where, where now? What's that? I think the question that we actually addressed a little bit earlier perhaps is the one, you know, what do we do now? Uh, going going away from here uh, with this knowledge of resilience. Well, I think I've already said it. Um, you know, on a practical level, you know, there's various things to think about. You know, like what would actually happen if there was no longer a gas and electricity supply to my house? Now, think about that, and then think about a practical change you can make that will help you to be more resilient under those circumstances. Um, I think for me, um, it's about the humility to really look at, you know, what, what are the things that I'm doing? What are my big, you know, challenges? Like, because I've got huge amounts of addictions that I've got to deal with, you know, they're nothing serious that's going to kill me, but... Um, but yeah, so for me, it's that humility of like each and every one of us going out there and just thinking, you know, what, what change can I make now, you know, and, and it, it, it's really addressing that kind of this, is it about the inner change or is it about the outer change? And for me, it's just like a real a call on all of us to remember that there is this twin path of leadership and that each and every one of us is that, that leader that we're waiting to, you know, to find, to see. And that if we can go out and do that, if we can go out and really, really look at what's the stuff we're doing that's contributing and who are our allies to go out and make that bigger change, then that twin path is what's going to get us there. If we all believe in each and every one of us that we hold that power, because we do. And it's each and every one of us here today that is going to make that difference. So just believe in yourself would be my biggest thing in terms of addressing resilience. Um, uh, I lived up until 2005 uh, in Ireland and 
lived on land and was building a house and planting fuel forest and planting vegetables and this, that and the other. And when I kind of really got the whole kind of peak oil climate change thing, I remember having that moment of thinking, well, actually, do I want to be sat at the end of my driveway when all my neighbours are freezing cold and I haven't got anything to eat? Do I want to be sat here with a shotgun? Uh, no, I don't really. Actually, that's not a future that I particularly want. And actually, in that case, I'd rather share it out and be just as cold and just as hungry as everybody else. And so for me, actually, it's really about being of service to the place that we live and seeing this as something that, that, that needs to happen more widely across the community, involving as many people as possible. And I think the key thing is, like I was saying in the talk before, that actually that process of making the place that we live more resilient, more, more, more robust, more... more uh, engaged and so on, is actually, I think our role is to argue the, the huge benefits to the place. You know, with the places that we live, we've got youth unemployment rising sharply, we've got uh, funding being cut from this, that and the other, we've got a whole generation walking around that don't know what's going on, uh, and actually I think if we can get it right, uh, which is starting to happen, and the, 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 that process of bringing resilience to the places that we live, not just to ourselves and just to our families, actually could be the turnaround for those places. And I think people are really, really hungry for that because more and more people in councils, in governments, in these kind of, in education, realize the scale of the challenges and they haven't got the foggiest. And at this time, everything's on the table. And I think the ideas that are emerging from events like this and things like transition and resilience and all this kind of stuff is actually as valid on the table now as anything else. And it's really fascinating to see when those get picked up and they're, they're talked about as, as having as, as equal weight as the other tools that are being considered. So I would say that going away from this, um, that, that the resilience could be the making of the place where you live. It's not just something we do because something dreadful is about to happen. Actually, you know, we haven't had anything really as a kind of a big uh, common focus since World War II in this country, really. And actually, since the 60s, our big sort of collective mission has been to get more stuff than the previous generation. And that's not really much of a mission, and it's why so many people feel so lost and bereft and bewildered by the whole thing. And I think, actually, the process now of resilience could actually be the making of us, and I think it's really, really exciting. I agree that resilience uh, could, could be a, a really great thing. But I think we should also not be afraid of considering scenarios as if, uh, you know, what, what we're going to do if there isn't a power supply, what we're going to do if, if uh, there isn't any fuel, what we're going to do if there is an economic collapse. These are things that need to be thought about. And they are different things from the transition conversation. So what I would say is that, you know, if you, if you can think about that and then take some practical action, that really is the, is the positive element to this. Because if you can transfer that into positive action, doing, doing things that you've always considered to be important but ne were never urgent, you know, things like, for instance, you know, having a, a personal water filter, things like that, really simple steps, that's the kind of thing I would suggest doing. And, and on a community level, reaching out and making time for that conversation in your community and, and resource mapping as well, finding out you know, who's got what and, you know, and, and having contingency plans. That's, I think, a really, really important part of this whole story is actually to explore it and to do it with as least fear as possible. But uh, I think that if we, if we take those positive action steps, it can be a really, really positive uh, impact on, on our communities. Great. OK, well, I'd like to thank our panellists. It's been a fascinating discussion. We could have uh, lots more. Please give them a big hand. Thank you. Really amazing. Thanks, guys. Really, really, really appreciate it. I'm glad we delved in some pretty hardcore subjects and you all dealt with them very well. Um, Mike, thank you as well for chairing the debate so brilliantly. Um, as was mentioned,